Thank you. Uh, gosh, I, I'm glad I took a break because I, I feel completely different and we can kind of rejoin uh, some of my ideas uh, in a new way. And I look forward to conversing with you, Duncan, further about reconciliation. Uh, so in British Columbia, we made a bunch of agreements that we would ha share a responsibility to react to First Nations health, that we would react together to inequities. Because if you work in public health, you know that um, supporting the status quo and keeping inequities is actually immoral. Just like um, with smoking, smokers actually cost us less because they die so early. But we don't promote smoking because we're moral. We have to do what's good and right. And uh, my husband is from South Africa, and if you go to South Africa and you see the inequity, inequitable distribution of resources um, between white South Africans and other South Africans, um, you can feel um, that sense of outrage. And thank goodness the governments of, uh, sorry, the government of South Africa is very actively trying to address um, inequity. But um, here in Canada, um, there are fewer of us who raise our voices. So we made a bunch of agreements. The agreements are less important than the principle that we would share responsibility to address these inequities. Uh, shared commitment. And we made a plan, just like the city of Toronto is making a plan to look at Aboriginal uh, people's health. And a plan, uh, our plan is um, at most 28 pages. It's very thin, but its action items are only a page and a half. There are about 36 of them. 36 single sentences, uh, commitment to uh, address inequities. Uh, and uh, in that plan are a number of action items that hold many of these um, principles uh, that I've been discussing before. Health actions, our work, health actions is the usual um, programs or health programs that we see all the time. Uh, child care, child maternal health, smoking cessation, and the like. But one other area was um, governance. Governance is simply asking the question, who's in charge? Uh, so the three members, um, the province of British Columbia, the country of Canada, and the First Nations themselves uh, sat together. And it was very clear sometimes who the lead was. For instance, the BC Cancer Agency, a provincial entity, looks after all British Columbians with cancer, not just all British Columbians minus the Indians with cancer. And very clearly, they were the lead. The First Nations weren't saying, we want to open our own cancer center. We, the First Nations, want to run cancer care ourselves. They said, no, clearly you're the lead. Uh, when it came to giving grandma aspirin in communities, the communities wanted to lead. Because the old model, where they had to phone Vancouver or Ottawa and ask a clerk for permission to give grandma medication, was not just expensive. It was bureaucratic, it took a long time. And not, was it, not only was it bureaucratic, it was also not evidence-based. Asking a clerk for permission to give medicine is uh, contrary to what we do as physicians. Um, it can be extremely harmful. So the idea of governance was, uh, a ver was a long set of meetings and fully half of our work. To give you... Uh, a story about what governance truly meant, though, uh, I remember a meeting where I sat with a group of chiefs who wanted the return of infant babies, the bodies of infant babies, um, in the event of sudden infant death syndrome. The chief coroner was present there, and uh, the chief coroner said, you know, by law, by BC public health law, by the Coroner's Act, I am allowed to keep an infant's body as long as I deem appropriate, within reasonable limits, less than two months, in order to determine a cause of death. And the chief pounded his fist on the table and he said, we know you think you're in charge, but we think those are our babies. We think those are our families. And it made it very clear to me that governance is shared by all of us. At the very least, they shared jurisdiction over that poor child's dead body. And so when this case of JJ with leukemia came up, um, I was uh, very aware that physicians should not be the only stakeholders at the table in determining whether a child lives or dies or what happens to a child. Um, I presented to medical students uh, in British Columbia, and they were quite outraged, as often they are, uh, as quite often they are. And they said, how can um, a ruling 
uh, be based on ethnicity. If this was a Jehovah's Witness, the child would be removed and the child would be forced to have a blood transfusion. And just because Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in blood transfusions doesn't mean that that child won't be transfused. But this ruling says the child can't be removed because of the constitutional right of Aboriginal people to use their own traditional medicines. That's ethnicity based and it's wrong. That child was allowed to have traditional medicine based on ethnicity, and many of us here with other ethnicities aren't allowed to do that. So I tried to explain to her that it was actually not ethnicity-based. It was based on our unique and distinct status as founding nations within the Constitution, and uh, she really didn't understand what that meant. She kept coming back to um, an ethnicity-based uh, decision. The idea really is nothing about us without us. Nothing about us without us. And in speaking to the city of Toronto today and their planning, uh, and they were very um, keen about this, that um, even if they were the funders, they weren't the sole stakeholders. And that including partners, including First Nations people who have been working for generations um, to improve their own health was extremely important. And this idea of nothing about us, without us, um, is, uh, is a European ideal, and it's one that's stated in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. A duty to consult. A duty to consult. We asked the First Nations in BC, tens of thousands of them, what kind of health system that they wanted. And in the top five, in the top five answers of the hundreds of thousands of answers that they gave us, were that they wanted a holistic approach. They wanted a mind, body, spirit approach to wellness. Not just physical wellness, but um, emotional, um, mental, and spiritual wellness as well. They also said that they wanted to include traditional therapies, that they didn't want a system that was a poor shadow of the dominant culture's health system, that they wanted the health knowledge that they had received when they were growing up integrated uh, into, their, um, into their system, uh, and we agreed. Here's a picture of what we've been fighting for in British Columbia, and we've given permission to 100,000 provincial health workers to include in their work plans, not just their areas of expertise, um, but to include the social determinants of health that they are allowed with their Aboriginal clients to go above and beyond um, their ordinary duties. Oh, last of all, uh, I was uh, well, there was an elder that I worked with, a very beautiful elder woman who taught me her language and her dancing when I was a teenager. And when I was in my 30s, I was lucky enough to work in her tiny village. And she came in one, one day as I was about to leave at 10 to 5 in the afternoon, and I was to leave my shift at 5 and go down island and go to my sister's graduation. Uh, she came in in um, atrial fibrillation, an unstable rhythm that could degenerate into a fatal rhythm really, really fast. She was in her 80s, uh, and the doctor said to her, we don't even have a heart monitor here. You need to go to an ICU or to a cardiac care unit. We need to fly you to Vancouver. And she said, she said, no, uh, I'm going to die here. Don't send me. And he said, I have nothing to help you. I have to send you. And uh, I said, I I'll stay with her. I'll be the heart monitor. I'll just um, you know, hold her wrist and take her pulse. And if her rhythm changes, if anything changes, there's a crash cart, I know what to do. So I sat with her all night. I missed my sister's grad. My sister didn't talk to me for three months. I missed yet another family event. And uh, at seven in, seven in the morning, the next day, her rhythm just spontaneously converted on its own to a normal rhythm, and she was fine. And a few months later, her son came up to me in the street and said, remember, do you remember you saved my mother's life? And I said, oh, please don't tell people that. That really makes me uncomfortable. I didn't do anything. She got better by herself, and that's really embarrassing. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, she didn't want to die under your watch, and she willed herself to live. <laughs> <laughs> she was worried that she would scare you to death at the beginning of your career. <laughs> and uh, I think of her all the time, because the point of our work is not to be um, good white-collar professionals. 
um, but to be extraordinary human beings, decade after decade after decade, uh, and to um, be people that our ancestors would be proud of. Thanks. <laughs>